Welcome to the program. This is the Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter. And today, we're going to be talking about some philosophy of science. That's right. Uh, specifically, we're going to be doing that via this text right here. It's Charles Darwin's The Descent of Man. So in this book, which was released much later than his more popular, or maybe even most popular work, on the origin of species. The Descent of Man is released much later in his career and it discusses uh, his theory of evolution further. In The Origin of Species he talks about his theory of natural selection, that concept, and then in The Descent of Man he goes even further and talks about well evolution is not just uh, natural selection, it's also composed of sexual selection. Uh, the females of species select males based off of their preference and that has an influence on evolution on top of just the natural environment so there's these two major aspects going on that result in what we know as this theory of evolution so he goes really deep into that in his text uh, however <laughs> uh, this, this is a big text this is like in this version penguin classics edition it's like almost 700 pages uh, so he talks about a lot of stuff, and what I found interesting uh, is what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about his idea about morality, you know, how it relates to his theory of evolution. Because it's very fascinating, and it also is akin to some very popular philosophers, like David Hume, for example. So let's discuss. I'm going to start us off with our first quote that I picked. And I'll let you know the page number <laughs> if you got the Penguin Classic Edition because, you know, people ask for that. So, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay, this is page 134, chapter 4. It's called Moral Sense is the name of the chapter. And this is the end of the second paragraph here. So, I will begin. Such actions appear to be the simple result of the greater strength of the social or maternal instincts than that of any other instinct or motive. For they are performed too instantaneously for reflection, or for pleasure or pain, to be felt at the time, though if prevented by any cause, distress, or even misery, might be felt. In a timid man, on the other hand, the instinct of self-preservation might be so strong that he would be unable to run any such risk, perhaps not even for his own child. Charles Darwin right here is talking about how is morality expressed? Okay, how do we express morality? You know, that's a basic thing that we need to talk about. And he's talking about the notion of self-preservation and how animals and living creatures go beyond that instinct. Do things of, of self-sacrifice for the greater good of the species. How does that work? And specifically, how does that work within the framework of his theory of evolution? So I'll continue here. This is the third paragraph on this page. Some persons maintain that actions performed impulsively, as in the above cases, do not come under the dominion of the moral sense, and cannot be called moral. They confine this term to actions done deliberately, after a victory over opposing desires, or when prompted by some exalted motive. But it appears scarcely possible to draw any clear line of distinction of this kind. So we're discussing the idea of what, how is morality expressed, and one notion is, well, morality is expressed when somebody gives up their sense of self-preservation and instinct. You know, what's good for me? And, uh, but a person might do something that's good for somebody else and while hurting themselves, you know, not uh, or disregarding or not listening completely to their instinct of self-preservation. And now, is this what morality is? Like, can we define morality in this way? When morality is expressed in that way, is that truly what actually is morality? <laughs> you know, this is, so these are philosophical questions, interestingly enough, and we're talking about them, or Charles Darwin is talking about them, within the framework of science, you know, this theory of evolution. So we have this inquiry, and we're going to move on to page 135, first paragraph here. As far as deliberation and the victory over opposing motives are concerned, Animals may be seen doubting between 
supposed instincts in rescuing their offspring or comrades from danger. Yet their actions, though done for the good of others, are not called moral. Moreover, anything performed very often by us will at least be done without deliberation or, or hesitation, and can then hardly be distinguished from an instinct. Yet surely no one will pretend that such an action ceases to be moral. On the contrary, we all feel that an act cannot be considered as perfect or as performed in the most noble manner, unless it be done impulsively, without deliberation or effort, in the same manner as by a man in whom the requisite qualities are innate. So what's being discussed in that quote? Well, you know, imagine like uh, first responders, right, who go through great lengths to save somebody, you know, a tragedy happens, natural disaster or some sort of act of terrorism, for instance. Yeah, you see that a lot of that in the news and then, you know, you hear first responders risking their lives, uh, trying to save people, and then you ask them, you know, they celebrate it, you ask them, how did you do that? How did you perform this self-sacrifice? And one common answer you get from first responders is, well, I didn't even think about it, I just did it because it was my job and I was just doing my job. And, you know, they're praised for that. <laughs> and I'm not saying that's uh, wrong or good or, you know, that's, you know, it's a great thing. And what Charles Darwin is saying is say, uh, these, these things are, can be considered moral, uh, but we have to think about what he's trying to understand is the, what is morality? And how does it relate to evolution? So when you're not even thinking about it, when it just happens automatically, and it's like, oh, that's just my job, I'm just doing it, and the instinct of self-preservation just shuts itself off automatically, um, then there is no deliberation, right? There is no like moral uh, idea, uh, moral thought process in the head. At least, uh, you know, maybe it's like a fraction of a second that's happening. So what Charles Darwin is saying is that's, that's an instinct. That's, a, that's instinctive behavior. Uh, it's almost automatic. So is morality just an automatic thing? Is, you know, is morality an instinct? You know, oftentimes we think that morality is going above your instincts or ignoring your instincts, uh, you know, self-sacrifice, uh, disregarding your instinct for self-preservation. But when people do these sacrifices instinctively with little thought whatsoever, then that throws that into question. So is morality a nullification of instinct, the disregard of instinct, or is morality instinctive? Are we naturally moral or are hu human beings and living creatures do we have morality built within us? This is the question. I'll continue. I'll just right where I left off. He who is forced to overcome his fear or want of sympathy before he acts deserves, however, in one way, higher credit than the man whose innate disposition leads him to a good act without effort. As we cannot distinguish between motives, we rank all actions of a certain class as moral. If performed by a moral being. A moral being is one who is capable of comprising his past and future actions or motives of approving or disapproving of them. We have no reason to suppose that any of the lower animals have this capacity. Therefore, when a Newfoundland dog, this is an example he's using, drags a child out of the water or a monkey faces danger to rescue its comrade or takes charge of an orphan monkey, we do not call it its conduct moral. But in the case of man, who alone can with certainty be ranked as a moral being, actions of a certain class are called moral. Whether performed deliberately, after a struggle without opposing motives, or impulsively through instinct, or from the effects of slow gain habit. So this is a little old school text, right? Because let's say, you know, he's talking about like this dog, for instance, in his mind, he's like, well, that's just a dog being a dog. Dogs are by nature self-sacrificing. Um, nowadays, you would, we do see, like, in our society, we do refer to that as more like, oh, that's, that's such a great dog for doing that. However, the, the fact remains, it was instinctive. There was a little thought involved. The dog just did it. Right. And people do this, too. Human beings do this, too. Like, for example, he's also bringing up the act of a monkey who just takes on a, an orphan child, like, oh, the monkey 
the adult monkey adopts the orphan child. Just, just does it. Now, is there a thought process behind that? <laughs> it's like, do, do, they, do they weigh their self-preservation versus uh, the needs of that monkey? Or is it just an instinct? Is it it's just the monkey sees the orphan child, like, just automatically, I accept you. <laughs> like, what's going on here? So we're talking about motives, and are motives really something that's considered, or are these just instinctive behaviors? And so is morality instinctive, or is it an act against instinct? You see, we're still asking this question. Let me read you my notes in the margin. Now you know, because I'm trying to make sense of this too. <laughs> uh, is morality the overcoming of instinct using rationality or the disregard of rationality for social instinct? Where does morality truly come from? What really is morality? <laughs> Let me continue on the next page. Page 136, starting on the second line here. Why then does man regret even though trying to banish such regret that he has followed the one natural impulse rather than the other? And why does he further feel that he ought to regret his conduct? So in short, what is regret and why does man or people, human beings, where, why do we have feelings of regret? Why? I'll continue. Man in this respect differs profoundly from the lower animals. Nevertheless, we can, I think, see with some degree of clearness the reason of this difference. I like how he says, I think, because he's like, I don't know. Because he's saying like, well, man, human beings, they regret. Animals don't. Like, you don't know that. <laughs> Maybe there's some animals do have a sense of regret. But this is back in the you know, 1800s. So, you know, but still, like, where does regret come from? You know, just in general. Let's think about that. Man, from the activity of his mental faculties, cannot avoid reflection. That's true. Past impressions and images are incessantly and clearly passing through his mind. Now, with those animals which live permanently in a body, the social instincts are ever-present and persistent. So here Charles Darwin is saying, uh, we always reflect on our actions. You know, the reflection, we're obsessed with that. That's what human beings do, and that's true. Um, and, he, and then he makes his other note. He says that uh, animals, which includes us, we're animals. Uh, we live in a body, you know, on this earth, you know, in this uh, universe that we live in. And in this body, we have these social instincts. They are ever-present and persistent. You know, these, these, the, we're in a society, and we have these instincts that are part tailored by that society. <laughs> so I skip down, this is in the middle of the second paragraph here. So it is with ourselves, even when we are quite alone. How often do we think with pleasure or pain of what others think of us, of their imagined approbation or disapprobation? And this all follows from sympathy, a fundamental element of the social instincts. A man who possess no trace of such instincts would be an unnatural monster. Or, you know, today we would call them psychotic or the psychopath or something like that. Uh, whether that's true or not, that's how we think of in society. Right? That's the social norm default of what we think when we think of somebody who just doesn't even reflect on themselves and their actions and what other people think about them. We're like, okay, this person is way outside the norm. But in general, we're always thinking about what people, how do people think about us based off of what we do? A process that goes through our mind all the time. Now you can learn to not think about what others think of you so much, right? But you have to train yourself to do that. That's not by default. And that's just, we're just generally speaking. It applies to most people. So let me read you the last sentence here on uh, page 136, and we'll continue on to page 137. A man cannot prevent past impressions often repassing through his mind. He will thus be driven to make a comparison between the impressions of past hunger, vengeance, satisfied, or danger shunned at other men's cost with the almost ever-present instinct of sympathy. 
and with his early knowledge of what others consider as praiseworthy or blamable. This knowledge cannot be banished from his mind, and from instinctive sympathy is esteemed of great moment. He will then feel as if he had been balked in following a present instinct or habit, and this with all animals cause dissatisfaction or even misery. So what's the point of all this? What's the central idea that's being expressed here? Well, if I look to my notes here, I said that whether by instinct or rationality, so whether the case is morality is an overcoming of instinct or it is instinctive either or morality is based on reflection or in other words morality is a philosophical action because it's an action that's based off of reflection you know mental reflection mental evaluation it's a philosophical action let's delve deeper and talk about what's going on here when i mean when i say that I, right now, I'm going to go to page, uh, at the end of page 137, I'm going to read the last part of this footnote, which is very interesting. To do good in return for evil, to love your enemy, is a height of morality to which it may be doubted whether the social instincts would, by themselves, have ever led us. Instinctively, or, you know, based off of survival, natural survival of the environment, we probably wouldn't have gotten there. <laughs> I just added that, but continuing with the text. It is necessary that these instincts together with sympathy should have been highly cultivated and extended by the aid of reason. So reason is also fa a factor into this. Instruction and the love or fear of God before any such golden rule would ever be thought of and obeyed. So what's being said here is that there's another factor playing into this, right? The social factor, this learned factor. People learn about concepts like God or like a golden rule, right? And they do things that are moral based off of what they learn, how they're socially conditioned and how their actions relate to that social conditioning and how they feel those actions fit within that social conditioning. So I'll read you my notes here on the margins. Morality doesn't come from the act. That's not morality. That's not what morality is. Morality is not the act on its own because people may do moral actions instinctively or uh, ignoring their instinct and going to reason. Really what morality is, it comes from reflection of the meaning behind the act, the philosophy of the act. When you make an action and you think about the meaning behind your action, that's when the idea of morality comes into play. That's where morality comes from. Let me continue this next quote. This is the last paragraph on page 137. At the moment of action, men will no doubt be apt to follow the stronger impulse. And though this may occasionally prompt him to the noblest deeds, it will more commonly lead him to gratify his own desires at the expense of other men. But after their gratification, when past and weaker impressions are judged by the ever-enduring social instinct, and by his deep regard for the good opinion of his fellows, retribution will surely come. He will then feel remorse, repentance, regret, or shame. This latter feeling, however, relates almost exclusively to the judgment of others. He will consequently resolve more or less firmly to act differently for the future. And this is conscience, for conscience looks backwards and serves as a guide for the future. So morality is based off of conscience, how one thinks their actions will affect others. That's what's going on. The opinion of others, ultimately. This is what Charles Darwin is saying. It's a survival mechanism. But it's a survival mechanism within a social context, you know, our social survival, which is very important. If you can't survive socially, uh, you can, that's a very dangerous situation. A social outcast is limited to many, many resources. So being socially accepted is more, very important to the survival of a person or an animal, any kind of animal for that matter. 
because uh, you you know when you're socially outcast you're limited to a lot of resources and I'm just gonna continue where I left off this is the second paragraph of page 138 the nature and strength of the feelings which we call regret shame repentance or remorse depend depend I underline that word depend apparently not only on the strength of the violated instinct but partly on the strength of the temptation and often still more on the judgment of our fellows. How far each man values the appreciation of others depends on the strength of his innate or acquired feelings of sympathy and on his own capacity for reasoning out the remote consequences of his acts. And I wrote, morality based on the opinion of others? <laughs> Question mark? Is that where, where morality comes from? Well, sort of, kind of, yes, because you know, you might say indirectly, but it is directly because what does it mean to be socially accepted? Welcomed within the society of your peers or your tribe or the people around you. Uh, well, they, they must have a good opinion of you or they must have an opinion that is appropriate to be accepted in their society. So your actions are based off of whether or not they're socially acceptable. So you can be accepted in the community and receive the resources and survive. <laughs> this is what Charles Darwin is getting at. This is what morality really is. So I'm going to skip down a few lines, stay on page 138. It is far from strange that an instinct so strong and so generally admired as maternal love, example, maternal love for instance, should, if disobeyed, lead to the deepest misery as soon as the impression of the past cause of disobedience is weakened. So a mother loves their child. That's just default. <laughs> and if a mother doesn't love their child, they're a social outcast. Like, oh, you're not a mother. You're, you're some monster or something like that. And the idea is that a mother loves their child. Sure, it's instinctive, but also there's a social rationality. Like, well, if I don't love my child, I'm going to be a social outcast and I'm not going to get resources to survive. <laughs> right, so that's, that's that rationality happening in, in the mind too. So it's both instinct and rationality and the rationality is based off of social acceptance. And this is all moral considerations. So I'll continue. Even when an action is opposed to no special instinct, merely to know that our friends and equals despise us for it is enough to cause great misery. So the idea that people despise us based off of our actions is enough for us to act in a way that gets rid of that feeling of despise. Like, oh, I better do things that my friends approve of. And then we th think of those things as, oh, those are moral things. The things that my friends approve of, those are the moral things. And it's all based off of social acceptance because again, when you're socially accepted, uh, you get access to resources that help you survive. So I'm going to read here page 139, and this is the 11th line right here. The 11th line of this page, in case you're following the law. The breach of a rule held sacred by the tribe will thus, as it seems, give rise to the deepest feelings. And this quite apart from the social instincts, accepting insofar as the rule is grounded on the judgment of the community. How so many strange superstitions have arisen throughout the world we know not, nor can we tell how some real and great crimes such as incest have come to be held in an abhorrence, which is not however quite universal. So now Charles Darwin is talking about well, how, why is morality varied? Like, you know, what one society feels is moral, another society might not feel as moral. You know, and then you have all these myths and superstitions and religions, for instance, or non-religions. And these are all based off of what's moral and what's not moral, what's ethical and what's not ethical. So what Charles Darwin is getting at is, is it's based off of your community and the judgment of your community. Each community has its own moral base. And he's talking about tribalism. Right. That's what he's talking about. Tribalism is the dictator of morality. That's what I put in uh, my margins here. What's your community, your group, <laughs> your tribe, whatever you want to call it, what they feel is moral is 
what morality is. And that could be different based off of the community. Morality is not universal. It's based off of survival in that specific environment. And that's what evolution is all about, right? That's why species vary in their uh, biology, in their, you know, their anatomy, because they're tailored to fit in their specific environment, which, you know, depending on the environment is different, and you have to, there's different requirements for the survival of that environment. And that's the same thing with morality, which is just an, another aspect of evolution in this process. So he's trying to communicate to you that this concept of evolution and how it applies to all aspects of life. Even morality is dictated by evolution. It's changed based off of how you can survive in that particular environment. So I'll continue here. This is towards the end of this paragraph, same page, 139. We may, therefore, reject a belief, lately, insisted on by some writers, that the ab abhorrence of incest, and incest he's just using as an example, and you can put any moral rule or consideration in, that, in place of that, is due to our possessing a special God-implanted conscience. God-implanted, you know, who implanted that conscience? our environment, our community. On the whole, it is intelligible that a man urged by so powerful a, a sentiment as remorse, though arising as above explained, should be led to act in a manner which he has been taught to believe serves as an expiation such as delivering himself to justice. And he's just continuing up the thought that we've already been discussing. Morality is based off of the judgment of your community. This is what Charles Darwin is saying. And you know, you want to be accepted in your community to survive. Because <laughs> your community is what's giving you the resources. So social acceptance really is what morality is. I'll continue reading. This is page 140. This is the sixth line right here. Formerly, it must have been often vehemently urged that an insulted gentleman ought to fight a duel. We even say that a pointer ought to point, and a retriever to retrieve and gain. If they fail to do so, they fail in their duty and act wrongly. And he's just, again, using more examples. Back in the day when you gentlemen had to duel <laughs> with a gun facing off against each other, and if you didn't do it, that was like, oh, you're not a gentleman. You're a coward, which is immoral. But, you know, it's the same thing. Somebody pushes you to a fight, <laughs> right? And, you know, you don't fight, you know, you're considered a, a wimp, <laughs> right? Or if you don't fight for certain things, oh, that's, you know, you're not really moral. Your you're, you're cowardice is making you do the wrong thing. And we even do that to other animals, right? When we, oh, he just uses a pointer setter, for example, uh, you know, a breed of dog. Uh, if that point of setter isn't pointing toward the animal that it's hunting, then what's what's wrong? We bred the point of setter to do that. Uh, it's not doing that. <laughs> or, you know, the golden retriever, for instance. Its point is to retrieve. That's what we bred it to do. And if you throw the thing, uh, the stick or whatever, and it doesn't retrieve, then, oh, that must be a bad dog. <laughs> right? Because it's not doing what we bred it to do. It's not conforming to our social standards, uh, what we socially think this person or this being is supposed to do. So morality is based off of our social needs, the social needs of the community. And if they're not fitting, the, the actions are not fitting the social needs of the community, then they're immoral. Right? This is what Charles Darwin is, is trying to discuss here. And I'll continue right where I left off. If any desire or instinct leading to an action opposed to the good of others still appears, when recalled to mind as strong as or stronger than the social instinct, a man will feel no keen regret at having followed it. But he will be conscious that if his conduct were known to his fellows, it would meet with their disapprobation. And few are so destitute of sympathy as not to feel discomfort when this is realized. If he has no such sympathy, and if his desires leading to bad actions are at the time strong, 
and when recalled are not overmastered by the persistent social instincts and the judgment of others, then he is essentially a bad man. And the sole restraining motive left is the fear of punishment and the conviction that in the long run it would be best for his own selfish interests to regard the good of others rather than his own. Let me read you my notes. What is moral is dictated by what is socially acceptable, which then shapes behavior. So again, this is why uh, morality is varied uh, in different cultures and societies. So, you know, this is what Charles Darwin's theory is saying, is that morality is just based off of survival. You know, what is socially acceptable within the community? And people will change their behavior and, and do things di differently. Their, their instincts will be either, either overwritten or embraced based off of what's socially acceptable. Someone's morality, one's ethics, is varied based off of their environment. Because it's all, in the end, it's all about survival. See how morality fits within Darwin's uh, theory of evolution? That's what he's ultimately trying to do here. So I will continue to read the on page 140, this is the third paragraph, the third line here. In order to be quite free from self-reproach, or at least of anxiety, it is almost necessary for him to avoid the disapprobation, whether reasonable or not, of his fellow man. And I put in my notes, if one really doesn't care what others think, punishment is used to ex enforce moral behavior. It's about limiting social resources, you know, uh, being socially accepted, and the society gives you resources like, you know, a house, uh, a home, you know, you might get some tax breaks, for instance, uh, you know, you might get certain jobs, uh, jobs that may be restricted based on how you act or how you portray yourself, uh, your means of support may be restricted. And it's not just that, you know, oftentimes uh, if you act outside the social norm, you'll be punished. <laughs> like literally like the police will arrest you or, you know, somebody will beat you up, you know, you'll be exposed to violence, that kind of thing. Or, you know, you'll be exposed to social ridicule, which can mess you up mentally, psychologically too. So it's survival based off of all of those things. So morality is also based off of the social consequences of one's actions. And those social consequences can be positive or negative. So let me skip to all the way to page 680. And here he just does a summary of everything he's talked about. It's like the last chapter, general summary, chapter 21. Uh, but I'll just read his summary of his idea of morality based within the context of evolution. So let me read you basically uh, summarizing what we just said. This is the last paragraph of page 680. A moral being is one who is capable of reflecting on his past actions and their motives of approving of some and disapproving of others. And the fact that man is the one being who certainly deserves this designation is the greatest of all distinctions between him and the lower animals. But in the fourth chapter, I have endeavored to show that the moral sense follows firstly from the, the enduring and ever-present nature of the social instincts, secondly from man's appreciation of the approbation and disapprobation of his fellows, and thirdly, from the high activity of his mental faculties, with past impressions extremely vivid. And in these latter respects, he differs from the lower animals. Owing to this condition of mind, man cannot avoid looking both backwards and forwards and comparing his impressions. Hence, after some temporary desires or passion, has mastered his social instincts, he reflects and compares the now weakened impression of such past impulses with the ever-present social instincts, and he then feels that sense of dissatisfaction, which all unsatisfied instincts leave behind them. He therefore resolves to act differently for the future, and this is conscience. Any instinct permanently stronger or more enduring than another gives rise to a feeling which we express by saying that it ought to be obeyed. A pointer dog, this example we had used before, if able to reflect on his past conduct, would say to himself, I ought, as indeed we say of him, 
to have pointed at that hair and not have yielded to the passing temptation of hunting it. And we'll just keep going here, page 681. This is the second paragraph, seventh line. The motive to give aid is likewise much modified in man. It no longer consists solely of a blind instinctive impulse, but is much influenced by the praise or blame of his fellows. The appreciation and the bestowal of praise and blame both rest on sympathy. And this emotion, as we have seen, is one of the most important elements of the social instincts. And I'll read you my final quote here, page 682. This is the ninth line of the second paragraph here. Ultimately, man does not accept the praise or blame of his fellows as his sole guide. Though few escape this influence, but his habitual convictions, controlled by reason, afford him the safest rule. His conscience then becomes the supreme judge and monitor. Nevertheless, the first foundation or origin of the moral sense lies in the social instincts, including sympathy. And these instincts no doubt were primarily gained, as in the case of the lower animals, through natural selection. You may or may not be familiar with uh, Sigmund Freud's, uh, you know, the famous psychologist, his theory of the ego, and he also had this concept superego and id. Uh, the superego, it was like the conscience, is the part of the mind that tells you, oh, this action is not right, you shouldn't do this, or this action, yeah, you should do that. And what's that based off of? Uh, it's based off of what's socially acceptable. Uh, you might say like, well, it's, no, it's actually based on what's right and what's wrong. But how do you know what's right and what's wrong? You were taught that. And you were taught that by who? Your society. Your society taught you that. Ultimately, you do these things, you know, according to Charles Darwin, because they increase your survivability. Right? Your ability to survive in the social environment that you are brought up in. And you do that so much that it becomes an instinct. So the, the instinct, the innate instinct, is to survive, right? your survival. Um, and you learn that survivability is related to social acceptance. And through time, your rationality uh, caters to what's socially acceptable. And eventually, this rationality becomes so innate, so automatic, that it joins with the instinct uh, the, you know, the instinct to survive, and it basically becomes a survival instinct. And this is what, what Charles Darwin is talking about when he's talking about like uh, people who uh, nullify their instinct of self-sacrifice or just push it aside to save somebody else or to save the, somebody in their society. And they do it with little thought. It's just like automatic. And you know, you see your first responder and say, well, I just did it because it was my job, it's my duty. Or like, you know, a soldier will be like, oh, you know, I just did my job. You know, that's what I was trained to do. So I just did it. Well, Charles Darwin is saying, well, you can call this morality or you can call this not morality. Um, it's evolution. You know, it's part of how biology works in nature. And like biology, anatomy, and, you know, the diversity of biology, you know, why flies have like uh, compound eyes and we have the eyes that we have. You know, frogs are different in their way and you know bees are different in their way um, anatomically also morality is var varied as well uh, based off of survival and the different kinds of survival that have to be customized due to our environment and this is ultimately what Charles Darwin is saying so it's a little philosophy of, well it's a lot of philosophy of science right but it's also philosophy of morality you know it's ethics which is fascinating if you want to get really get deep into Charles Darwin's thought process, check out and you know also his theory of evolution. He expands upon his theory of evolution uh, way more in uh, the Descent of Man, which is right here, than in the Origin of Species. Like if you really want to delve into uh, the theory of evolution and Dar Charles Darwin's thought process, check this book out, The Descent of Man. Well, you've been watching. The Black Ponder. Tune in next time for more philosophical thought.